we're here at IE Valley to meet up with Louise Cucucci for her new exhibit called Lines and Dots. Okay, let's just take a quick overview before Louise starts talking to us about her work. Raindrop series, Sue Me, which is a carbon-based ink that bonds with the paper, and then Gansai, which can be mineral or vegetable-based. Very similar to Sumi ink, it also bonds with the paper and it, cr it creates the color. <clears throat> this is called Shadow. This exhibit being called Lines and Dots is that it really is what Sumi painting is about. It's been around for more than a thousand years. Again, we have these little beautiful little dots that create a shape in the lines here that Louise will talk about in detail. Sorry for the reflection. This is called Spring Rain. This is a series of the four seasons. I believe in spring, early May, all the summers I have seen, and autumn dusk. Louise will spend quite a bit of time with us on this piece called Dawn. Then we go to Rain and Sky, a one stroke with the Gansai circle and the lines. And we have a few older pieces that we've had at the gallery for a few years, and these are gorgeous. They're, um, I've got four of these older ones that are framed like this, and then we'll end up with... Kokishi dolls. So let's talk to Louise. Louise, thanks for coming today. Okay, hi Margie. I'm glad to be here to talk about my work. Uh -huh. And um, why don't you start with your raindrop series, and it's these are mostly sumi ink, I believe, but go ahead and tell us about them. These, these raindrops are one stroke. They're not dabs on the paper with a brush, but they're actually uh, strokes which are used in calligraphy. So there is a starting point and an ending point to uh, these round shapes. For example, with these, uh, if you can imagine my hand as a brush, I started here, went around, came around, and went up. And so the beginning and the end of the brush stroke is inside of the circle. And this line here is actually a hair of the brush sp splitting oh, okay. off in the process of making the circle. Okay, and the color comes from the Gansai? The color comes from the Gansai, and to do that, I load the brush mainly with ink and put the Gansai color on one side of the brush. And so when I turn it, the, the blue uh, spreads with it and ends up here. But you can see there's some blue here yes. and here as well. Uh, because as I twisted the brush, that part of the brush came in. That's beautiful. One, that's a one, one stroke. And there's yeah, there there, are four there, of these in the series. Yeah, they're all one stroke. And um, uh, they are um, they're an integral part of calligraphy to do it that way. And mm -hmm. one of the features of doing a stroke like this, a circular stroke, is that you do get a sense that it has volume, that it's three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. Yes, that's beautiful. 
And well, let's go on to the next piece. And this is, what's the title of this one, Louise? This is Rain, Rain Washed Night Sky. Okay. Now, Tell us a little, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, if we can focus on the rain part of the painting, um, each rain falling is one single stroke. Uh, I never reload the brush when I paint the stroke. If I start to run out, I slow the stroke so that the ink, so that the ink from the top of the brush can reach the tip. Oh, okay. So, um, you see, for example, in this one, I was running out, so I probably slowed the stroke down so that I could finish. Ah. And each, each succeeding brush stroke is a response to the preceding one. Really? So does that mean that you bring more control into it then, or...? Um, no, I, I just, I just, when, when I, when I paint the second one, I'm, it's really just responding to the first of one. Of course, yeah. And the third one is in response to the two preceding yes. one, and so on. So it's very much a calligraphic um, principle that oh, okay. when you write a character, the second stroke responds to the first, the third to the first two, et cetera, et cetera, until the end. And so you have a unity to the separate strokes. Oh, okay. Because they were painted in and influenced by the previous. That's right. Which is, I've never studied calligraphy. I didn't know that was a um, yeah. precept of it. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. What about the um, dots? Were these dropped with, or were these blown? Uh, these were dropped, okay. but um, I'll come back to the drops in okay. a little while. Okay. Okay. If we can move on to yes. the uh, one with the uh, magic stone. Uh huh. This painting. Uh, now, uh, a while ago, I was in my garden and I saw. Um, one of my rocks, uh, usually there, very quiet, mm -hmm. brownish gray, mm -hmm. but it had been made wet by the rain or the hose. I don't quite remember. But when I looked at it, I could see um, that it had yellow spots, greenish spots, oh. and bluish spots, oh, yeah. that it had become quite a beautiful rock um, and different from what it had... Uh, what I had thought of. When it was dry. When it was dry. And it made me think about uh, a poem by the Swedish uh, Nobel laureate, Vislava Zimborska, uh, where she writes a poem called Conversation with a Stone. And in it, she asks the stone if she could enter it to see its magnificent halls. Oh magnificent caverns and, and hallways. And the stone says, no, you cannot enter because you don't have a taking part sense. And from that, I understood the stone to mean that she was not open to the stone. She had preconceived ideas of what the stone should be should be inside, but she would not let the spo stone speak to her. Huh. And I, I thought that was a very interesting um, uh, observation. It's, mm -hmm. it's really um, a question about knowledge, how we attain knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's um, one-sided from our ruminations on what reality is, or if we let reality enter. That's right. And change our concept of. It's kind of almost, maybe it's like immersing yourself, like one, you're kind of a spectator sitting in the stand, mm -hmm. and the other, you're more immersing and becoming part of or something, yeah. That's right, right. And open to something that you may not want to hear. Yeah, getting rid of those preconceptions. Right. So. That's beautiful. I thought it was a great poem. 
And you painted these, you told me, from the back of the paper. Yes, uh, um, I, I tried uh, painting the, the colors first and then painting the sumi on top. And the sumi was so strong that it would cover uh -huh. the, the, um, uh, the colors. So I tried painting the colors from the back. And it seemed to seep through more for some reason. Huh. And then I painted the sumi on top. And it didn't you had cover to break it. Through your old ideas, I guess. Right? <laughs> exactly. I have to listen to more stones. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the, the and the lines again. The rain reveals a magic stone. Okay, that's lovely. Yeah. And this is a, a kind of a set of three here. Mm -hmm. And this is about uh, uh, blades of grass mm -hmm. in May when you feel the vitality of plants when mm. the earth has uh, warmed up mm -hmm. and reaching for the sun mm -hmm. and there's so much vigor. Mm -hmm. That's really expressed in those green lines. Yeah. And that's a kind, some, sometimes these pigments in the gansai have a natural metallic kind of sparkle to them and that happens in that middle of that sun, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. A quick, I'll just do a quick, like there is the moss on the rock. Right, and, and this was also done like the raindrops uh, with one brush stroke. No. Oh. Black ink and with green on one side. Okay. Yeah. What would you like to move to next. Oh, let's move to the dots. Okay. And maybe I can tell you how I do the dot paintings. So, um, the dot paintings take, uh, this one is called Dawn, and it's um, the sky from my kitchen window early in the morning when there's still some darkness, but you can see the, the sunrise um, erasing that darkness. And um, so the dot paintings um, take me uh, a long time to prepare because I have to find the right colors. Um, it often takes me days. Uh, my record is two weeks for for being for finding the right color, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, um, in preparation for the painting, I have to create enough of each color uh, to finish the painting, because if you stop painting, there's a very tiny, a minuscule difference in the spacing of the dots and in the size of the dots. But there is a change which can be seen, and um, I believe it changes the integrity of the image. So I have to paint it at one go. So in one sitting almost, yes. or standing, these are done flat on the paper, I mean, of course, flat on the table. Right, and I'm standing over it. So uh -huh. these, um, you know, they, they can't take from four to six hours to um. paint. And, um, um, so I have the colors set and I've worked on the size of the dots and the spacing of the dots. Um, then, then I can start to paint. Now, the, uh, the dots are, are, I make the dots by dropping them with an eyedropper or I sometimes blow them through a, a, a straw. Hmm. And you can see the splatter marks of uh, uh, the air pressure. pressure. And what determines, you told me the gold were blown. Yeah, I think they are. And yeah. um, what determines, how do you decide, um, is it the viscosity of the pigment that makes you decide what is dropped and what is blown? Or um, No, actually it's more um, an emotional thing. Okay. Uh, for example, in this it's probably the sun bursting through the, the oh. darkness of the night. Oh, yeah. That sort of thing. But, um, so, 
I, I often paint sky paintings um, in dots. For example, in uh, the rain-washed night sky. Mm -hmm. that that's the second that, one we looked at. Yeah, that's also the sky at night with stars and darkness. Mm -hmm. And the use of the grid actually comes from a grid that my brother showed me many years ago. Mm. The grid that he showed me was a astral map used by Hawaiians to navigate the P Pacific Ocean. Oh, astral map, okay. Yes, they made the map with shells, which repre represented stars, and the lines to hold the, the grid together, they used uh, pieces of very thin wood, uh, but, in the but in the right position, so the stars were correctly placed. Mm -hmm. And at night, they would hold this grid up to ascertain their direction okay. and make corrections. And I thought that what they did to, uh, to find your way in the in infinity mm -hmm. was, um, was very good, was very useful. And so I use the grid and the dots as sort of my way of navigating uh, through painting. through this kind of infinity. Huh. Now sometimes um, the space is not the the physical space that we know that we look at, but sometimes in my paintings the spaces are of um, emotional or mental states. For example, a number of years ago, I went to Madrid and did sketches um, at the Prado Museum of paintings by Velázquez, El Greco, mm -hmm. Goya. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I made these quick sketches. And when I came back to Seattle, I made uh, these grid paintings of the moments when I entered the paintings of Velasco or El Greco um, so that so when you look at a painting by for example for example Las Meninas by mm -hmm. Velasquez oh, um, you, you know I don't see myself in the painting but I see myself experiencing the painting mm -hmm. And so uh, there are paintings that, that I did which are based on those experiences. Okay. Yeah. And when I see the dots, I can remember exactly uh, what I was experiencing. Wow. So I can, even though they're just dots. Wow. You know, for example, with this painting, I can see um, <laughs> my kitchen sink, I can see uh, my Japanese maple. I can see my neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in the kind sky of a beyond. template for your memory right. space somehow. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I have a couple questions about this. Mm -hmm. If I can remember what they are, um, do you first put a little pencil mark down? Uh, the no. place where you're gonna where you're gonna draw? No, I okay. have I have uh, measurements here on the on the sides. Oh, okay. Uh, because they're pretty straight. Okay. And I start with number one here, always here, and I don't know, I don't do all of the purple paints at one time. Okay. So I start with number one. Then I do number two, and I look at these two, and I say number three has to be this. Okay. And so, like calligraphy, the same as calligraphy. Yeah. It's the same as calligraphy. Okay. One stroke, then the next, and uh -huh. the next. Okay, that's fascinating. And I think that answered my second question. Um, also, um, do you? Can you just? Is this? I know your paper. Mm -hmm. What we're actually looking at is two layers. The first. 
right. sheet of paper has been painted on and then it has, when it's finished, it's mounted on a second. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a specification of your paper? I know it's either Jap Japanese or Chinese. Is, is that correct? Yes, they're, they're, um, they're always Japanese or Chinese. Um, and I, I bought them in Japan and mainly in Japan, but I have also bought them in Paris. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They have very good paper in Paris. I'm sure they do. Chinese paper, actually, it's <laughs> from Taiwan. Um, and um, they need to be backed by a second paper because mm -hmm. when you paint very thin paper, it puckers naturally. It's yes. like dropping water on tissue paper or Kleenex. Yes. It, it pu puckers. And to make it flat, you mount it onto um, a dry, a drier sheet of paper. Uh -huh. Now, because the inks and the colors are completely indelible, they don't run okay. when you mount it onto the second sheet of paper. And so, for example, you could drop this painting into a bathtub and the paper would disintegrate, but the image would still be there. Oh, wow. The, pa the image would disappear when the paper completely disintegrates. And, uh, and so, unlike watercolor, it actually bonds with the paper. It's a complete bond. I, I, I think of it as an alloy, when you have okay. a completely new element. It's, okay. they're, they're not, the paints and the inks are not floating on top of the paper. Okay. They're completely apart. Uh, That's the really fascinating. Yeah. And so if you look at um, Asian art history, you can have paintings lasting over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, because when the paper starts to disintegrate, they, all they do is put another paper, paper in the back. Paper underneath it. That's right. Right. And um, the image will be That's the same. Right. That's so fascinating. Right. And usually, uh, the inks don't seem to fade at all wow. from a thousand years. Wow. Some of the colors do, but I've also seen colors on very, very old paintings. Yeah, and it probably depends on how exposed they are to the different light or whatever. Yes. Okay. Yes. Should we, would you like to talk about the Kokeshi? Yeah, Kokeshi. Okay. Let's see. Let's, uh, Is this a good time unless there's another flat work that you wanted to talk about? Or? We can probably talk about the Kokeshi dolls. Okay, um, whichever one you would like to. Um, we've got five of these in the exhibit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. Well, we'll just start here. Maybe, the closest one. Yeah, give people an idea of what the tradition is. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we have, this is kind of fun because we have people in the gallery during this time. So you guys ask <laughs> questions too, if you like. Um, so, Kokeshi dolls are part of Japanese tradition. They're actually, I don't believe they're actually dolls to be played with. Yeah. But they're, uh, because they're wooden, they're stiff, they don't move. But um, I'm going to move around for a minute, Louise, and get sure. better. Could, I'm going to have you move to the other side of the doll. My light is not that great right now. There, okay. that's better. Okay. Okay, and, so you can keep talking. And, um, and so, for example, I've, I've always uh, uh, had Kokeshi dolls. Um, uh, they're, they're given as gifts, uh, and sometimes you buy them when you go on a trip and you want to remember that you went to uh, usually northern Japan. Kokeshi dolls come from northern Honshu. Uh, mm. So if, for example, you go to a northern city like Sendai, you might buy a Kokeshi doll. Mm -hmm. Now, um, while I was living in Tokyo, I met with a sixth generation Kokeshi doll maker. And he told me that the inks used on, uh, on Kokeshi dolls were the same used in Sumi painting. Oh, okay. To which I said, well, I have those paints. <laughs> so I just needed the dolls. Yes. And what we did was we went to secondhand stores and and bought the unwanted uh, old Kokeshi dolls. So these these are kind of like tchotchkes that are common to the households in that very area? Very common. Very, very common. Okay. Well, they're actually common throughout Japan, okay. but they originated in northern Honshu, northern okay. Japan. Yeah, so um, I have a bunch of these. Um, 
And uh, some friends gave me about five or six of them as well. And um, during this past year, during the year of the pandemic, um, I, I thought that the ordinary people were pretty remarkable in trying to carry on um, in, under very adverse conditions. And so I decided to try to paint them, um, to try to paint the Kokeshi dolls as ordinary people. Mm. So they're all wearing masks. Mm -hmm. This one is looking at his cell phone and um, there's a date written on the scarf, mm -hmm. but it's January 6, 2021, mm -hmm. when there was an attempt to um, overtake the Capitol building, mm -hmm. uh, deter the counting of the recognition of the election results and um, by Trump supporters and uh, the very right wing uh, um, groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so I have um, the black the flag, the Confederate flag, the Confederate flag, the QAnon image, mm -hmm. and um, the um, the black flames trying to engulf the Capitol building. Oh, yes. And this is done in Sumi and Gansai. Sumi and Gansai, that's, that's right. It's done traditionally. Yep. And this is a little replica, actually, almost of the Capitol building, is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. The, the number of columns, et cetera, uh, is correct. <laughs> I, I to it yeah, you said it was not easy to paint on this round uh, on a curve. On circular surface. Yeah. Yes, very tricky. <laughs> yeah. I love these. I'm going to give a quick little view of a couple others here. Okay. While we're here, this is the this is the Black Lives Matter demonstrator. Yeah, with the umbrella. With the umbrella, and and these are tear gas clouds, and he's using the umbrella to fan them away. Mm hmm And uh, and then over here we have um, the boater. It's a very involved piece. This one has uh, these lines like this, and they represent mail-in ballots. That's right, on their edges. So on the, their edges. So it goes from the blue, you had to make each line go from blue to red or yes. black. Right. And um, the icon of the Postal Service. Yes. The American Eagle. And is it the governor of Georgia's quote, or is he, was he a senator or a It was um, the person in charge of the voting in oh, Georgia. the election results. Right. Yeah, exactly, the election. Yeah. So I have the exact uh, electoral college votes, the number, and the exact votes for the president. Um, oh. And then the quote by Brad Raffensperger, yes. who stood up to uh, Donald Trump on, I think it was July, uh, January 2nd or 3rd, when he, when Trump called him to ask him to find 11,000 votes for the Georgia yes, election right. so it could be overturned. And Raffensperger said, well, Mr. President, your challenge is, the challenge that you face is that the data you have is wrong. Yeah, that's extremely uh, that courageous was so man. So great to hear him say that. Yeah, very very courageous. Yeah, these are man. fascinating. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Louise? No. <laughs> I think that's it. So we'll say goodbye from IE Gallery, and Louise's exhibit will be up for two more weekends through the rest of the month. Thank you for joining us.